Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. What's happening, guys? Welcome back to another show. And this week's guest, I'm really excited to tell you about someone I've been trying to get on the show for a long, long time. It's Dan Machichi. Uh, Dan's had an incredible career already. Uh, he's worked in academy football at Palace, at Tottenham, uh, MK Dons, where he was head of the academy. And then he also worked at England in the 16s, uh, had a stint as MK Dons first team manager, worked at Arsenal for the academy, many, many roles. And um, just recently as assistant head coach of Crawley first team as well. So uh, I don't say this lightly, you know, I mean, I've, I've traveled around the world and worked with a lot of people and Dan is one of the best I've ever seen. He is literally world class, one of the best in the world of what he does, a top, top coach. And uh, like I said, been asking him to come on the show for a long time. He's been a very busy man, but finally he agreed to come on. Really good, interesting story. Lots of goals to share. Um, I mean, I mean, the reason I went back into academy football uh, last year to work at Arsenal because Dan asked me to come in and support him with the 18s. And uh, the only one of the main reasons I went back was went in there was literally just to go and work with Dan alongside him and learn off him because, like I said, he's one of the one of the best about. So. This is a fantastic podcast, really privileged he's finally agreed to come on the show and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And don't forget, remember, that My Personal Football Coach Virtual Conference is live. Uh, 14 of the best player developers in world football presenting. Download it, keep it forever. And it's not to be missed. And remember, it's a unique uh, discount code for you guys, Podcast VC. Podcast V for Virtual C for Conference, Podcast VC, 20% discount. But check it out. Follow the link in the bio. And without further ado, let's get into the show. So, Dan Machichi, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sol. Nice to see you. Yeah, can you just give us a brief outline of your playing and coaching journey up to this point, mate? Yeah, playing-wise, I didn't play the game professionally. Um, I've played at, um, at youth level for a few professional clubs, but then went into university and went to Loughborough University and focused on my education. Played some football there as well, a bit of non-league. And then coaching wise, I got my first opportunity in academy football back in 2003 with Paul Holder, um, who's now at the FA. I was very fortunate that he gave me a role at Crystal Palace and um, doing the under 10s. I then went to Tottenham. I was very fortunate to get employed by John McDermott and Chris Ramsey when they first went into Tottenham. Again, under 10s, did that for two and a half years. Then I went to MK Dons, um, was. Um, had a meeting with Mike Dove, the director of youth, and it was very fortunate the academy was only a year old. So um, got initially involved with um, overseeing the 8s to 12s, and then that involved to 8s to 14s, 8s to 16s. Was there for seven and a half years, then went to the FA. Um, again, very fortunate. Dan Ashworth had just gone in. Um, St George's Park was very new. Spent five years there. Various roles, technical lead. Uh, national coach etc uh, had a brief spell as MK Don's manager um, then I had three and a half years at Arsenal um, Academy again per very new to the role and his vision into the academy so it was an ex exciting time went in as under 15s and ended up as um, 17 to 23s phase lead and then uh, just recently been assistant manager at Crawley wow <clears throat> incredible so incredible career already so just tell us about then, uh, what did you what did you study at Loughborough? So at Loughborough, I did a degree in sports science and management. I then did a master's in international management. And then I actually went to, I forgot to say, I went to University of Liverpool. And I did an MBA in football studies. Oh, wow. So, um, I spent in all five years at uni uh, university. How, how, so, how do you think those courses prepared you for, for coaching? For coaching, not so much because they were quite varied in their roles they were quite theoretical in terms of sports science and the management side I wanted to keep my options open they give you um, an insight into coaching and you start doing your badges but I think what it did most of all was the network they developed was at Loughborough um, there's people now who are outstanding practitioners Chris Jones who's been with Frank Lampard at Chelsea and Everton um, Tony Strudwick who I had the fortune to work with at Arsenal which was an incredible education to work with him uh, he won the Champions League with Man United in 2008. And Sam Erif, who has just gone to America, 
Um, but he he worked with Guardiola for many years at Man City and he's been there for a number of years. And they're all outstanding practitioners and they were leaders in the field when we were at Loughborough. So they had graduated a couple of years uh, before us and they'd started the sports science uh, department at the FA and really started to evolve it and put in place the Fitness Trainers Award, which is a course that I did that other than the pro license that I'm on now, with the Welsh FA, I would say the Fitness Trainers Award was the best course I've ever done. And they were a big part of that. Interesting. And you said you played there, Loughborough. What position did you play? I tried to play central midfield. Um, and um, yeah, let's just put it this way. There was better players around me. So we uh, we had a lot of success in our team and um, I was a small part of it. I imagine some mercurial, you know, Italian sort of number 10 floating around creating, uh, yeah. creating bits. Exactly, something like that, yeah. <laughs> After okay. a, a few nights out of that week as well. <laughs> so tell us about then your first your first coaching job. Paul Holder, yeah. obviously a living legend in the game, someone we both know really well. Tell us about that first opportunity at Palace. What was that like? Tell us about yourself as a coach. What sort of stuff were you delivering? What were the influences in, in your career at that time? And, you know, as we all know, and you're a young, impressionable coach, you know, taking things from everywhere. Tell us about that sort of beginning part of your journey. Yeah, I'll be honest with you, it was a strange introduction to coaching because I hadn't really come through a conventional route, which maybe I was fortunate by that. I didn't really have any coaching habits. I was just very new to it. I hadn't been in coaching roles before. And I guess getting the role was the power of networks again, because um, a friend a friend of mine from Loughborough knew Paul really well and put us in touch. And Paul being Paul, he was just very open. And I think he employed the person more than the professional. And um, there was another guy there called David Njai, who um, was overseeing the younger groups. And they were just doing things very differently. Him and Paul, they, on a Sunday, for example, when we do like four periods, we would, they would say, they would say um, on the sideline, listen, just let them play for this period, no coaching at all. So we would just be in silence on the side. Even if we wanted to say something, we didn't. Um, or we'd set little challenges like um, they'd be on five, they had to take a minimum of five touches before they passed the ball. Um, because we found that at times they were very frantic with the ball. And we'd only put those little um, constraints in for a short period of time set little challenges, um, certain players would be in charge of the communication on the field for certain periods of the game as well. So they very much saw the games program as an extension of training. Paul never asked me about results all season, uh, which was probably a good thing because we didn't win many. But honestly, I've never, uh, MK Dons was fairly similar, mainly because myself and Mike ran the program and, you know, that was the culture we wanted. But other than that, I've never really, really worked anywhere that dismissed results completely. And then in terms of the training sessions, I remember quite early on, so I'm working with this under 10s group, Sol, and they, um, you know, you think you're doing the right things and um, you think you know their level. And Paul, I said to Paul, I was one of those coaches and I still am when I'll ask people that I know are better than me, come on, come and take them for 20 minutes so I can learn from them. So he came over. And he put them into this tight area. I remember it was like four squares, um, two in each corner. And he was doing a game where you had to, it was about passing into feet or space. And to, to get a point, you had to pass it into a square and run onto the ball um, at the same time. And I thought to myself, no chance they're going to be able to do this. It's too tight. The numbers are equal. Um, it would just be too difficult for them. And within five minutes, because of how we managed the environment, it was too easy. And I remember just thinking, wow. And and just the way he managed the group and he got peer-to-peer um, -peer learning, like he would stop it and say, come on, show us what you just did there. So he would get an individual to explain to the others what he did, why he did it. And Paul very much just facilitated the environment. And I remember just thinking, I've got a lot of work to do, but that's the level. And that's what young young children are capable of if they're in the right environment. Did you had you done your your FA courses by that time? Your, yeah, your I, I done my. I, I was a B license coach, and obviously, I've not seen the B license recently. But back then, it was very different to um, how Paul took that those twenty minutes. And obviously, then, ironically, Paul was 
a pioneer for the youth modules, etc. So it was a very different form of coaching that you were expected to do on the B license to one that um, you know you, you you needed to do with nine year olds. What what would, what would a typical session maybe look like for you then at that time with those tens? Yeah, there there was a, a, the coaching syllabus was <laughs> it was very structured but also very um, fluid as well. So you had a list of themes that you were expected to get through by the end of the season. So it wasn't week one you're doing working on X or week two you're working on Y. It was here here's a framework then it's down to you. Now, I probably was maybe too experienced to have that amount of freedom. I may be looking back, needed a bit more structure, but I got the guidance through them anyway. So it was very technical based, very much about, um, there was minimal tactics. It was, uh, um, you know, how they strike a ball, how they receive a ball, um, ex- you know, how they dribble past somebody inside hooks, outside hooks, how they use their body, scanning. You know, it was very much breaking the game down. So um, they trained, um, I think it was three three times a week um, and then played on the Sunday. And like I said, the Sunday was another training session. Um, and what I mean by that, players, you, you know, the children would play in different positions. There'd be set different challenges. You know, there'll be nothing around formations and tactics and things like that. And um, so obviously, as you can imagine, there needed to be a really strong culture in place and parents being well educated in terms of what this game should and could look like at that age. How long were you there at Palace? One season. And what would you, what would you say the main takeaways were for you as a coach coming out of that environment? I would say it was more around child development, like understanding children, understanding how they take on board information, how you should communicate to them. So I, I, I learned to be very specific with my communication. So rather than saying, well done, tell them what you're, what are you saying well done for? So is it excellent pass, Johnny? Well done. And, and, and then show it maybe non-verbally so maybe because also the parents can see this as well so when you're when you're actually encouraging or praising you're actually speaking to the parents as well a bit like a manager when they say post-match that manager is not just doing an interview to the media he's speaking to the board and to the fans and to the players it was similar concept on the side of the pitch so move your body in a way show them what you've just seen so it might be movement off the ball. So let's say you did an overlapping run and the ball didn't even come to you. I might have had the ball and I had a shot. It goes over the bar. I now communicate and praise you for your overlapping run and and really celebrate that so that the rest of the group and the parents go, this coach is looking off the ball. This coach is, see, is not just focused on the ball. And on the outcome of this game, he is looking at the processes that are taking place within this game. Interesting. And in terms of Ben, then you move across North, across London to North London to the uh, project of Tottenham. How did that come about? Yeah. So again, goes back to relationships and networks. So David Njai, who was with me at Palace, who even to this day um, mentors me a lot. Um, again, more so in terms of child development, psychology, a <clears throat> uh, really good sounding board for me. He knew Chris Ramsey, uh, put us in touch. And um, yeah, I went and had an interview with him and John McDermott. And um, yeah, they offered me the under 10s role and Paul Holder was moving across to the Beckham Academy. So he, he, he wasn't staying at Palace and he was a big part of me being there. So going into Tottenham, I just from meeting John and Chris and what I'd heard um, I thought I didn't think I was ready I didn't tell them that but um, I didn't I I knew I wasn't ready but I was prepared to put myself in an uncomfortable situation and learn very quickly. Then tell us about that that environment you went into what what was that at the time Spurs like? Yeah it was it was um, looking back now I mean well ahead of their time in terms of practice design 
Yeah, everything had transition in it. Everything had multiple outcomes. It was a lot different to Palace. It was a lot more intense. Um, but they were they had a different vision. You know, they were trying to develop a Champions League player. And this, I guess the scrutiny and of Tottenham and also the perception because in their first year there, they made a lot of changes. But they also inherited a lot of rough diamonds and a lot of talent. And um, and also maybe maybe players who would have got released possibly by other clubs, uh, whether a different playing style maybe wouldn't have got the best out of these players or they were just late developers. And they had a very good eye for those types of players. They were very patient. And um, not in the sense that they would keep everybody, but if they saw something and they could see in the future, then that player would stay. And um, I remember the first in-service training session we had with John. John leading it, but it was packed to the room. We had all the scouts all across London, um, had all the coaches, everything. Everything was shut down for the day. Everybody was in there, him setting out the vision, him setting their level. But then what was so impressive about these guys was they'd always take it out onto the pitch. So again, I mentioned Sam Erif before. Sam Erif was at Tottenham at the time. So, so Sam Erif did the sports science session. And again, it was very perception based. So you were getting functional movements out of the exercises, but you're getting a lot of scanning and a lot of football uh, foot patterns. And um, it was a very good leading into the actual football session. Ricardo Monitz was there as well, who you'll be aware of. And Ricardo was, um, you know, well known worldwide for um, individual um, ball mastery. So Ricardo then took some of the session on the pitch. John maybe didn't that day, but he would have done in future ones. So, um, yeah, the, the, the bar was set extremely high. And, um, yeah, every, every they just didn't want to waste a second with the players. It was very intense, um, but in a good way. And they, their, their work ethic was incredible. You know, they tell, were us the that, tell, us about that, tell us about that methodology then. I mean, you know, you talked about the, the some of the practices, but in reality, what was that? I mean, you know, you mentioned Ricardo there. Tell us about what was unique about what Spurs was doing that maybe Palace and most, you know, every other club in England wasn't doing, basically. Yeah, I mean, um, I think just the level of detail they could go into. I mean, the, ses the session itself, it always start with a ball leech and um, there would be, it'd be core skills, but it'd be done at a, 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 a a pace but they they were also very very good at breaking things down so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be taking a child from a to z and then just in 10 minutes and regardless of how well they were doing something they would then move on they were very much about they would set something up and they knew what they were looking for but if they had to break it back down they would and um they wouldn't move on until they were happy and then, um, yeah, then they'd move on to a ball between two, a ball between three, get passive pressure in there. And then um, in terms of when it would go into a game, it was very fluid. They wanted a lot of rotating of positions. And again, it was very technical based, very technical and movement based, as opposed to about results and about... Um, you know, staying in a rigid sort of structure. I was playing in a shape, not a position. And um, yeah, and they were very much, like I said, because the bar had been set so high by John, you know, about Champions League players, you'd get that constant reference all the time. And the players, you, they'd reference back to players a lot in terms of, you know, players at Tottenham. So Modric, for example, but also a Fabregas and those types of players as well. And what are those players doing? You know, back then it would have been Iron Robin, for example. I'm showing my age now. Zola, they had the Zola zone. So, you know, they would talk about the world's best and they would call core skills about after the world's best, like the Zidane, the Maradona. And um, yeah, that, that was the culture that they built. And then they would want to see those things in games. And even in if they were doing a passing drill, it would start with two outside, an outside hook, an inside hook, and then you'd play a pass. So that, that there were because John and Chris had a very good understanding of teaching. Um, they understood a lot about anchoring the learning. These are all things that I was oblivious to when I went there, but a lot of anchoring in terms of you what you've done something, 
you then don't just put it in the drawer and never use it again. You you come back to it in the next session and you find a way of drip feeding it back in so it doesn't get lost. And um, yeah, what, what I learned a lot from Chris, I did an awful lot of Sundays with Chris and people talk about <clears throat> coaches being vocal or not vocal on the side. So at Palace, I, le- I, I was very much in a environment where you were not vocal. Whereas at Tottenham with Chris, you were vocal, but you were vocal demanding excellence. You were vocal demanding expression. Um, it wasn't restricting players. And I, I got to see firsthand and, and I, I developed firsthand that by being vocal, you can get more out of people because once you demand something of them and then they do it, you get that dopamine effect, you get them feeling good about themselves and then realising that they're capable of a lot more than they might have been if you'd have just stood there and did nothing. Yeah, interesting. And, and what about yourself then? I mean, you know, because obviously I worked in that environment. I mean, someone who's come through those conventional routes of coach education or you've been in one place, come in, how do you cope with that very unconventional style of coaching, very un-English style of session design, if you like, with that ball mastery, those small sided games, 1v1s, 2v1s, 2v2s, where maybe that's not what you're going to be getting on, on the FA courses or what they did at Palace. How did you how do you adapt there and upskill yourself? Yeah, I mean, I would go in on my nights off. So I would drive from wherever I lived back then and I would just go in, I'd drive through the traffic. I wouldn't be getting paid. I'd just go in the cold dome and, and watch for three hours and watch the likes of Chris and John work and Ricardo and um, and just make notes and, um, you know, just try and learn as much as I could. The style of play was very much what I believed in. You know, my influences when I was growing up was that type of football. I watched a lot of foreign football um, when I was growing up. So and foreign players um but in terms of the teaching side of it yeah i think it's just you have to be open you, and you have to be humble enough to know where you are on your journey and just it just accept that there are people who um are way ahead of you but that's fine you know they were older than me far more experienced and um you know the best way to learn is by observing and, and then trying to put it into action and just asking lots of questions. Again, I was very fortunate. I look back on my time there. Chris was, he was like available 24 seven, you know, he would ring me or I would ring him and we could spend an hour, an hour and a half on the phone. And there'll be things he's talking about that. If I look back on my notes now, I realized what he was saying, but back then I didn't have a clue what he was saying because he was on chapter 10 and I was stuck on chapter one. And, you know, it takes time, you know, what you have to do is accept that you can't just go from chapter one to chapter 10. You know, it is a learning process. And sometimes I think we rush, we might get jobs, but in terms of the actual learning and in terms of the actual developing your breadth of knowledge, it takes time. Um, And, um, you know, people like Craig Simmons, who I came across at the FA, very similar, you know, you, you, they they they've forgotten more than you know and you've just got to be comfortable with that and accept that you know it will come you know and because of the contacts john and chris had the likes of john all press were coming in doing cpds and steve rutter so you had constant education in that environment and um it was again the syllabus was structured differently so we talk about the palace syllabus being very I'd say freedom within a framework and quite loose, but it was clear what you were doing, but you had to be extremely skilled to deliver that. And I I definitely wasn't. At Tottenham, it was more in terms of six-week cycles. So week one is this, week two is that, week three is that. Um, but like I said, we got a lot of CPD and a lot of CPD on the grass as well. So, um, and um and then on a Saturday, we'd finish training with the under 10s. And I'd walk when the six under 16s were at home, I'd walk across and Chris was happy for you to be alongside him on the on touchline. And, you know, he had the likes of Andros Townsend and Ryan Mason, etc., cetera, Stephen Colker, um, Harry Kane, you know, those types who, again, at the time, you don't really know where this is all going. And they lost 
practically every week. And he used to get, you know, you'd hear the murmurings around the building about, oh, they lost again and they keep losing. And he didn't care. He didn't care. And he gave the players a lot of ownership. They did their own warm up, but they he taught them the warm up first and then left them to it. So they weren't doing a crossbar challenge. You know, they were doing dynamic flexibility with a ball, um, et cetera. And once he was happy that they knew it. So, again, you're developing leaders. Um, and then during the game, it was just a game of 11 individual development plans on this pitch. And this player needs this, this player needs that. So what, what, where my coaching probably developed there was about individual development and how individual, individual development looks within a team context. Interesting. And so then tell us about then the MK Don scene, how that came about. <laughs> yeah, so again, um, I, I probably, you should probably charge me a fee, but again, David Njai, who I'd worked with at the Palace, we continued our relationship. Um, and like I said, he's a learning mentor in a school and learn an awful lot from him but he also knows the game very well so I would go to games with him and he he he's very he taught me a lot about looking at individuals within a game as well and he would say to me give me a nudge and say did you see what Pirlo did there and I would say no because I'm just following the ball or looking at the game tactically and he'd say oh he just dropped his shoulder there and he got away from his man and all this sort of stuff so um he was brilliant for me and he knew Mike Dove really well <clears throat> so um Get in, put us in touch. I went and met Mike. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't going to go because I was, it's very difficult to leave a place like Tottenham. And we'd just been on tour to Italy with the 16s. So Chris took me because I could speak Italian. And, um, you know, you had the likes of Tom Carroll and Nathan Byrne and those types in an under 16 group looking back. Um, and, and others as well who maybe haven't come through. But again, it was such an education being in Italy for a week and just seeing how um, the, the, you know, the, the players were being developed, but also the types of competition that you're exposed to when you're at a club like Tottenham. We've just, done, um, we've just been invited to Wembley to be part of a, an FA showcase event. So now I'm, I'm talking to this academy manager at MK Dons and I'm thinking they're a year old. We'd played MK Duns the season before and it was like double figures. I'm thinking, you know, I, I went and saw John McDermott and John was like, you really sure you want to go there? You know, you're at Tottenham, et cetera. We believe in you. Um, and then I spoke to a few people that I trust in the industry and they gave me some really good advice. And they basically said, look, if you want to learn about youth development, you need to go there. You'll learn about Tottenham at Tottenham. And you'll learn certain things, but you won't ex get exposed to things that you will do at MK Dons. And, and uh, you know, me and Mike had the same vision for football and development. So um, I took the opportunity and, um, yeah, it, it what I started to do was get a lot more responsibilities across age groups, across programme design, delivering CPD, all those types of things. And, and also we were a dark horse, you know, we were a year old, we were the whipping boys, um, teams would often play their year below against us when I first went there, you know, such was the level of challenge that they thought, and that isn't a criticism of MK Dons when I went there, I was a year old, and the academy manager was doing everything, he was taking the under 18s, and he was just putting things in place so they actually had a licence, was looking back, you know, it was a miracle that they got the license, if you looked at, because it was before E Triple P. So in terms of, um, you know, you you were you were in the boxing ring with all the heavyweights, you know, you're with Arsenal, Chelsea, Tottenham. You're playing against all those teams, Villa, every week. And your MK Dons, the first team were in League Two. And um, it was, an, you know, if I look back now, it was an incredible challenge that we took on. What would you think then? I mean, you talked about those other things you're taking on. What about as a coach? What was the, what was the main things you 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 grew as as a coach? You know, how did you develop as a coach working with those? I suppose players with lots of different abilities and managing all those different sorts of roles. What were yeah. the main things that developed you then? Yeah, I think I needed to be adaptable because we didn't 
if we try, if I tried to do, if I, if I looked at Palace and Tottenham and went, right, we did this at Palace and this at Tottenham, let's do, do choose one of those two or this, do, let's take the Tottenham model to um, to MK. We would have failed because, first of all, we didn't have a full size dome. So we couldn't get the number of age groups in the dome at, the, at once. Um, we didn't have the level of player. We didn't have the level of staff, the quantity of staff, et cetera. So, and we weren't invited to the tournaments that they were invited to. So we had to think differently and work differently. So, and also I was getting fed up with people saying that English players couldn't deal with the ball under pressure. And, um, you know, it's, we have to think, we, we have to take ourselves back now. We're now in 2007. So 2007, there's no St. George's Park. A year later, England didn't even qualify for the Euros. So English football was getting heavily, heavily criticised for its style of play, um, for its coaching, type of players, etc. And I guess we, we wanted to be different and show that no English players can do this if you set the right environment and have the right playing style. So... In terms of results, again, I had to adapt with results because the groups were losing 20, 30, 40 nil. And if you carry on along that curve, if you have got one or two good players, they will leave because it was, you know, you, you're, you've got scouts um, at every game, et cetera, as we know. And um, because we were playing against those clubs, all it would take is for us to go to Cobham and play Chelsea, lose 30 nil, and a parent to see the facilities and say, oh, you know, Chelsea scouts just come up to me. Um, I'm going to go. So it wasn't a case of winning's important, but the goal swings were. The results mattered. So if we're going to lose, let's lose 6-4 or 6-5. Let's not lose 9-2. You know, and that that mattered in terms of player retention. That didn't alter how we played. In fact, it enhanced how we played. So we had to be heavily possession based, um, because as we know, if we've got the ball, the other team can't score. So, um, so from that side of it, it was um, from a coaching point of view, it was marrying development with results and thinking about the bigger picture. Because how, how, it, how does that how does that how does that affect your 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 session design then? What, what sort of things do you put in? How did you resolve that issue in your sessions? We we trained less and played more. We played more games. We probably played more games than anybody else in the country. Um, we played more games than we trained, um, and we played against a complete variety of opposition. Our our week was far harder than a Sunday or a Saturday um, because. And the players wouldn't even know. So they would turn up to training thinking they were training and they would see it, um, an, a private academy from London, 18-year-olds, and they're 13. And I'd say to them, you're playing against them. And it was to develop the, you know, the resilience and that, that uh, mentality side of things as well um, and get them feeling uncomfortable and being able to deal with um pressure is in on the pitch but also not feeling intimidated just like on a Sunday when you've got to go to play Aston Villa you don't fit we're not little MK Dons you know we're going to go to Aston Villa um or whoever it is and next time we play against an academy that wants to put a year below against us we're going to get into double figures so then they never do it again and um so in terms of our session design everything was opposed we didn't do anything unopposed. And that's not because if I look back now, um, I'm probably um, a bit more unopposed than I was back then. Um, but like I said, we wanted to show that you could deal with the ball under pressure. Um, so we did everything opposed. And that doesn't mean it was always equal numbers, but there was always some form of opposition, some form of decision taking place. And... Um, we hired some sports halls because we were struggling for space in our dome. It was only a 60 by 40. We um, we got some agreements with schools to get their sports halls. So we, we had a footstool programme running alongside 
a midweek games program, which everyone kept telling me we'll get fined if the EFL find out. But I would say to the, the I'd say to the club, take the phone fine then, because the players are getting better, and I, I don't see why we should get fined for playing football. Um, and um, again, through my contacts, I was able to get in Paul and John All Press and Pete Sturgis. These guys were coming in. Um, Paul in particular on a regular basis they were like my critical eye they were auditing us on a regular basis very informally so I would pick their brains in terms of the environment the players etc and um, you know we, we we very very quickly um, developed first of all had a change of mentality so we could go to a bigger academy and dominant and we actually started to win not that I was interested in actually winning there, but we actually started to win. And we, because we, ha we had good players, Milton Keynes was a good catchment area. And, um, you know, players started to, to thrive. And um, they were a very um, close-knit group as well. You know, we didn't have big numbers. So everybody played. We, we didn't have many subs, if any. So they were playing. The quantity of the, and volume of their play was far more you know we, we would play against teams who would have six seven subs and we knew that we might tire towards the end I mean we even went to games with less players you know if we were had a long journey I remember once we went to Norwich and we just took 10 and we played 10 v 11 Hi guys, hope you're enjoying the show. Just want to say, remember the My Personal Football Coach virtual conference is now live. 14 presenters, 14 of the world's best player developers, um, some of the best um, coaches and uh, from around the world, uh, from some of the biggest clubs as well. Check it out on mypersonalfootballcoach.com and an exclusive 20% discount code podcast VC. That's podcast V for virtual and C for conference. That's a 20% discount just for you. And listen, it's, you, you look at it, some of the best Chris Ramsey, Lewis Gota, Chris van der Hagen, Romeo Jozak, uh, Philip Sheed, uh, Paul McGuinness, and many, many more. These are some of the best player developers in world football, develop, you know, giving you quality insight. Like I said, you can download now and keep forever and watch and check it out because nothing else like it in the world. It will help you take your coaching game to the next level. But without further ado, let's get back into the show. And people will think, oh, but you got smashed. We didn't. It was actually the other way around. And what we do was, or we or we'd go to games with just 11. And people would say, well, what if you get an injury? And we'd, we'd take, we'd say, no, we, we know we're going to take so-and-so from the other pitch and he'll play two years up. So um, we were very big on playing against, you know, the research we followed was, maybe not the stuff that you got on the courses. It was the stuff that was in the papers or on the TV. Like Nanny, for example, at Man United back then. He said, when he got asked, how did you develop into such a good dribbler? He said, well, it, on the school playground, we would have captains. So I, I always made sure I was a captain and I picked the worst players because then I wouldn't pass to them and I'd be dribbling against the better ones. So it was sort of taking those listening to those things and going okay we, we're not going to replicate that but what what does that mean for us in our environment what does street football look like in a formalized setting it's playing against older players it's playing again on different size pitches you know we got a lot of criticism for the pitch sizes that we played on um and every sunday was that was the first battle to win with um with that so i remember we uh we played against a, a, a big club and we had when I when I started moving into now 11 v 11 it didn't really hit me when I was at Tottenham but I started to think we've actually got good players here who are a bit lack a bit of power and they can't get there and they can't kick the ball that far and but they can't really showcase their skills so a team turned up we had a full size pitch and then I just put flats on the pitch and I made a, a smaller pitch on the big pitch. So they turned up and I said, um, would you mind if we played on the smaller pitch with the first two periods? If you're not happy with it after the first two, I'll take the cones away and then we'll play on the big pitch. But we just want to do this because, um, you know, they're only 11 and um, we just find that it will suit the players, we think. 
So anyway, we got to the, last, the end of the second period and their players were miles better than ours. And they were winning comfortably like 5-1, 5-2, something like this. We had a few players come off crying. And um, I called them players. They're just kids at the end of the day. But uh, so apologies for that. But anyway, they come off crying. And I said, what's wrong? Ah, oh, there's no space. And I said, there is, but you've got to find it. And when you're not in space, what do you need to be able to do? So we talked through those things. We talked through a few combinations that they were doing in training and in their midweek games. Anyway, the, I said to their coaches, what would you like to do? They went, yeah, keep it going. It's great. So they were really happy of it. So I went, no problem. You know, I didn't want to take these cones away. I wanted us to show that we could do this. Anyway, we came back on one something like 8-5. And all our goals were through good combinations. The next day, we got a complaint from that club that the pitch was too small and a complaint from the Football League assessor who was at the game saying that the goals were too small, even though there was 13 goals in the game. And it was a more skill-based game. And we weren't pioneers of this because Man United were doing 4v4s for a long time before. John Cartwright, who influenced Paul Holder a lot of Crystal Palace, was a big advocate for smaller pitches etc so and you know then you know we got accused of um it's very anecdotal what we're doing and it was because we didn't have the stats then that we have now you know I wasn't there out there with a measuring tape and a lot of it was on the eye and a lot of it was trial and error and speaking to the the the, the people who are actually taking part in it speak to the kids and saying how is it for you what do you think what are you having to do how is it challenging you um so the, all these things accelerated their learning um playing in stadiums so we would <clears throat> play play we would end a season often you get your pitch but we would open it to the public the club were brilliant at promoting these things so I remember we played Chelsea and our first time we did it there was three and a half thousand there and um We'd done it with Man United the year before behind closed doors to trial it. And um, and I remember after the chairman saying to me, yeah, they were really good, our kids, but was it their development centre? And I kind of took it as a bit insulting because I thought, no, I don't be surprised that our kids have done very well against Man United here. Um, so anyway, the following year, we, we said, no, no, we'll open it to the public. And um, Chelsea were brilliant. They were aware and they had like Loftus-Cheek and Solanke and people like that. And um, we drew three or I think it was. And I, what the biggest thing I remember from the game was one of our kids, um, it was an under-15 game, he tried a Cruyff turn on the edge of his box after a minute and I think it was Jordan Houghton tackled him and scored. <clears throat> and somebody texted me afterwards saying, I thought when you conceded that goal that you weren't going to play out anymore. And in fact, we actually played out more. Um, and, you know, Delhi was in that game, Shea Ojo, Brendan Galloway, you know, Callum Britton, who's now at Blackburn, Kevin Danso, who's now at um, Lons. We were good enough, you know, and it, again, it goes back to what I'd learned in my previous experiences. It's not looking at a mistake and going, don't do that again. It's saying, right, why didn't that work? So it might be, they tried to dribble and got tackled. Maybe you didn't move your feet quick enough. Maybe you weren't deceptive enough. Maybe it was too. Maybe you showed your hand too early. You, you tried the Cruyff turn before he was tight to you. So it was really looking at the why it didn't work. And um, by the time I was leaving, I remember it was a funny story because we got so many stadium invites that Mike Dove even actually said to me, he, he actually queried what was going on. Because in my last month at the club, we went to Villa Park, White Hart Lane, as it was back then. We got invited to Colchester. We, we had about five as well as our own. And, and basically the feedback I was getting, went to Reading, Majetsky Stadium a few times. Um, you know, Lewis Go to Lee Heron were brilliant with us. But the, the feedback I was getting was, you present us with a different challenge. We like playing you. Um, so, you know, we play different shapes, um, but we were, um, you know, I guess we played with a lot of flair and, you know, we'd get accused of overplaying and things like that. 
But, um, you know, we weren't bothered about that because we had so many getting getting into the international scene as well. And we sold, sold Shea to Liverpool for a British record fee, £2 million for a 15-year-old, that we just had this um, real momentum going on. And, um, and it wasn't through loads and loads of coaching sessions but that a lot of that was due to do with our environment interesting so then let's move on about your, your next uh, role at the fa how'd that come about yeah the fa again because <clears throat> we were developing our reputation i remember we played west brom i think it was away on a very cold night and an fa scout come up to me and said oh um dan ashworth's here um He's asked me to say to you that he likes how your team plays and he likes a lot of your players. And, um, you know, Dan was brilliant for your late developers and seeing into the future, etc. cetera. Um, so anyway, roles came up and, you know, I went through the interview process. I had two interviews for that. And um, again, similar to probably Chris, being at Tottenham got me the Tottenham job as Chris maybe saw a bit of me and him if it wasn't for Dan and Dan's mindset and, and embracing diversity. And when I say diversity, I mean, in terms of skill sets and personality, maybe I would never have worked at a place like the FA because um, the culture that has been in place there um, over the years, maybe didn't, didn't um, see those types of things um, enough. Anyway, um, so I got the role and yeah, it was, it was basically <clears throat> the whole time of, there was no England DNA. There was no real playing style. <clears throat> there was no real way of doing things. And um, in a, in a sort of consistent way. And I guess that was because they didn't have a home like St. George's park now where they had their own sort of training ground. And um, Trevor Brooken, who was doing Dan's job pre previously, <clears throat> I think a lot of his role was very much geared towards grassroots and the Tesco skills program and the youth module. So it was all a step, step process, I guess. Um, and now Dan was coming in a lot more investment and he was able to put in place a lot more age groups because they, when he went in, there was no 15s, 18s or 20s in the national teams for a start. No talent ID, et cetera. So, um, it was an exciting time to go there. And again, a bit like Tottenham going into a very big organisation and that was going to move at a very fast pace. And the objective was, you know, we're building towards winning the World Cup. Did, did you think like, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, I remember those times when I first joined Tottenham where the English English disease was, you know, we couldn't produce technical players. Like you say, we, couldn't, we didn't have enough players who were, good enough on the ball or, you know, we weren't challenging a high level. Did you feel you were part of a movement there? You were like, feel right, we're going to change things. I mean, when I was at Spurs, I thought it was almost part of a, you know, something happening and moving, changing the, the convention of English football, try and do that. Did you feel like that? I mean, obviously, yeah. you're doing MK Dons, but then at the FA? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, it definitely wanted to become a lot more possession-based. Training sessions were different as well. More... Um, games more ball rolling Dan brought in he wanted 70 percent a minimum of 70 percent ball rolling and again people say where 70 percent come from and again it was anecdotal he hadn't researched it necessarily people started to look into it afterwards and and then we came to the conclusion that 70 percent was a good number across a camp rather than a specific session because sometimes it was sometimes you'll have a session that might be 90%. Some sessions might be 40%. You know, it might be in the heat. You might just be playing your third game in five days, et cetera. So, and he was, he was good with that. But um, yeah, in terms of, um, there was a strap line, which I kind I guess I was heavily involved with called Play With Freedom, which I use sort of the, advanced youth award to get a lot of my messages out because I was leading on the technical and tactical side of that as well <clears throat> and um I've seen different things over over the years where you see a lot of branding at clubs and things on the wall and 
a lot of it would say a no play zone, for example, and then no risk. And you'd hear, you see all these things. And then I'm watching, like, again, at that time, Barcelona were unbelievable, sort of destroying world football. Thinking, these players aren't even big. Like, they're tiny and they can shield the ball. They can protect it. They can manipulate it. They can receive under pressure anywhere on the pitch. And they're human at the end of the day. You know, why is it we can't do it? And it wasn't a case of we couldn't. It was the case that we weren't allowing ourselves to do it. We were so obsessed with results and <clears throat> mistakes happening that um, we couldn't see beyond that. So, um, you know, the, the clubs were doing a good job with the players. Um, so, if anything, it was easy, really, you know, to... It was probably the easiest job I've had in terms of um, getting young players to play in a certain way. Um, you know, if I, I remember we played Holland in the Val Demand tournament and they were in the same hotel as us and we had very little interaction with them first few days. We then played them. <clears throat> we actually drew 2-2. Two -two. They scored in the last kick of the game. Um, but we were like 73% possession and played really well and et cetera. And um, the game finished and their staff asked to see me and Richard Allen that evening. And they were just blown away with how we played. They were like, we couldn't get anywhere near you. And this was Holland. Uh, and then we go and play Brazil and Florida and the same happened. And Phil Foden got the two goals and um, we were like 94% pass completion that day, 68% um, possession. And actually, from a player development perspective, people like Jaden Sancho and um, Angel Gomez, they were on the bench that day because they played in our first game. So we played USA two days before. And a big part of our England DNA was, yes, we want to win when it matters. We're not, we don't necessarily want to win every tournament, but we want to win the ones that matters. And that Florida one mattered to us. Um, but everyone's going to play. And, um, you know, we're not going to bring people here and, you know, everyone's good enough. We need to see them. That's why we're here. Um, so, you know, you had Oliver Skip, you had Ryan Sessegnon, you had all these types who who were on that uh, camp, hudson Adoy, Smith Rowe. Um, so you look back and go, yeah, they were good players, but Brazil were good as well. And Brazil definitely want to win. You know, we played them enough to know they, they are serial winners. Um, but, you know, we were, you know, uh, encouraging the players to play in the right way. Like I said, play with freedom. And um, we had a real, we generated a real belief, I think, that, and Gareth was the head of coaching at the time. Again, might seem like, wow, that was a long, you know, it was a long time ago. But Gareth was the head of coaching, very supportive. Um, and the, the style of play was very important to what we were I, doing. I think I remember that's quite almost like a watershed moment, if you like. I quite remember that, you know, going, like I say, out playing the Dutch, outperforming the Brazilians in like in that in over there. Um, so I've got two questions about that. I mean, Jeremy, that time, what what are the main challenges as a coach then, coaching now at international level? That's the first one. Why don't I go to that one? Yes, <laughs> I guess the social aspect, really, because you don't know them as well as you obviously know ones that you work with in a club you don't see them every day and I'd always pride pride myself on relationships with with young pl players and um so my first thought was how am I going to build this connection with them so quickly so again we're very lucky at the FA that we got exposed to a lot of experts in that field in terms of creating an environment where you had lots of activities going on where you would icebreakers you know you would build um team cohesion and um, the environment and the social aspect um so for example on the first day that they would come in we might do an exercise in the classroom where we called it signature hunter signature hunting it was called so you'd have a sheet of paper and it'd have things written on it and then you had to get somebody uh, you, you could only get one person maximum one person to sign each one 
and it was the first one to get it all signed would win. So I might come to you and say, have you got a dog? And you would say, yes. I'd say, can you sign it? And then I've got to go and find somebody else. And it might be, um, I can speak fluent French. So I might go to somebody else. Can you speak French? No. But what you're doing is you're interacting with people. Mm. It's a bit of fun. You're learning about people as well. And then we take that onto the pitch. The first training session might be more head tennis competition. And and then you you you, you merge that with some tactical work in the breaks. Um, so your active recovery day, you've actually done a lot of social and reconnecting. Um, and they're things which you wouldn't do at a, a Tottenham or MK Don, but you don't need to. Um, and I guess tactically as well because you are now at a much higher level. Um, you are in tournament football. And whether we like it or not, the better you do in a tournament, the better the game you're going to get and the more it will, it will develop the players. So getting that balance between how you play, having the best players and winning is not easy. Um, and it requires a lot of, lot of skills and also having really robust processes because the debrief process was very thorough. So you had to then evidence afterwards, you know, the, the handover I gave to Steve Cooper for the group that won the World Cup was something like 200 slides. You know, it was information on each player mm. with the ball, without the ball, the environment, the training, etc. cetera. So you, you, you would, all that kind of stuff as well. It was far more, it was well, well more professional um and the planning aspect um you know it, it was the demands on your planning were huge interesting and, and to tell us about then because obviously you've been pretty much you know you've seen it from the bottom all the way to the top why do you think what do you put down the reason why we went from that you know that that moment where we just we didn't have any you know we didn't have that any quality technical players or enough quality technical players where now we've almost got you know, almost too many. Well, we have got too many to fit into one team. We've got so many quality attacking four creative players. What do you put that down to? Is that is that because of the clubs or is that because of the FA? I mean, what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think foreign managers have to take a lot of credit. They've come into the Premier League and um, opened our eyes to different ways of playing. Um, your Pochettinos of this world, etc. cetera. Um, I think they've had a big, big impact um, on what we do. Um, and then foreign players as well, their professionalism, you know, Ronaldo when he was here, etc. So we've had role models as coaches to look up to in terms of how these managers have played and also the types of things these players do. So even things like a wing back playing around the corner pass with his weaker foot into the nine. You know, they're all things which you you know you've either got to watch a lot of football globally to see certain things or they're, they're generally things which and it's not to criticize English managers or British managers because of course we've had some brilliant ones over the last few years as well like a Brendan Rogers for example but generally speaking um, I think they've had a big impact and influence on our game um, EPP as well you know more contact time the Premier League tournaments I think they did have a big influence on the England groups doing well because, say, for example, when we played Holland, when I'd speak to our lads, I'd say to them, do you know any of their players? They knew half of them already. And they'd be like, yeah, I played against him in a tournament in Switzerland. I played against him in Barcelona. I played against him in Dubai. You know, they'd been everywhere. And a lot of that was, some of it was to do with the Premier League tournaments, uh, the international tournaments they do, but also the clubs now you know, we're, we're getting exposed to a lot of these tournaments across the world, which um, has grown a lot over the years. And um, I think just the accountability, you know, EPPP saying, what's your vision? What are you trying to achieve? How are you doing it? And people will say it's too much admin, PMA, et cetera. Maybe it is, but maybe it needed to be that extreme to now hopefully at some point you know bring it more in here and you know just just I think the youth modules as well I think the youth modules educated people in terms of I think it was split into developing the player the practice the person something like that and I think Pete Sturgis John Allpress and Paul Holder do not get anywhere near enough credit that they deserve because 
if I think back to the content in them courses and how skillfully they put those courses together, they they really taught us about those three things. What 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 do you get from a drill? They didn't say don't do drills. That's where they were very clever. So they know they would have lost people. They said, when you do a drill, this is what you get. When you get when you do random when you do variable and random practices, these are the things you get. So as long as you know what you get, crack on, do what you want. Um, so I think that you know they were um, exceptional in their field as well. And um, yeah, I think we the the country has changed, the 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 demographics has changed, um, and that's helped as well in terms of um, the type of players that are in our country you know when we those England boys that we talk about you know Angel Gomez is Portuguese you know in terms of a lot of his heritage the way he received the ball was like a Portuguese player not really like a stereotypical English player and although we have got good technical players I've been watching the TV this morning they've been talking about Ballon d'Or winners and the best players over the last 10, 15, 20 years not one English player got mentioned I'm not saying they're right, but they talked about Zidane and Hullet and all these types of players um, over the years. You name, you know, you look at Brazil. You know, if you go to the Brazil training centre on the wall, you're going to see Neymar, Rivaldo, Romario, Ronaldinho. The list will go on and on. Um, so I still think we've got a way to go to really go to that next level in terms of Ballon d'Or winners and the very best, one of the best players I've worked with never gets mentioned and he's Marcus Edwards. You know, Marcus, you know, I, I'm, it's so pleasing to see that this season he has um, started really well and the goal he scored at Tottenham was incredible. And I know you know him well, but you, my first job when I was at the FA was really, um, you know, supporting these types of players that maybe weren't, you know, we often look at and say they can't defend and those types of things. Um, Messi walks around the pitch for 90% of the game. But in our culture, we still see that as being lazy. We would say, yeah, but he's messy. So-and-so isn't messy, so he needs to work. But the clue is in what Messi does. He's, he's, he's not being lazy. He's saving his energy. Is very clever coaching from the manager to go, right, I'm going to play to this person's strengths. But when you get the ball, I expect you to be top. Otherwise, you give us nothing. And what he's also doing, Messi, is he's, he's, watch, he's carefully watching the game to see where our space is and, you know, where the gaps, who, who can I run at next time I get the ball. Um, so... I still think we've got a long way to go, um, but, you know, we are slowly heading in the right direction. And so then let's move on to, to, your, to your last role in youth development then <clears throat> at Arsenal. Just about, I mean, what what the main, I mean, you worked 15, 16, 18, head of PDP. I mean, what were, the, what were your main takeaways from that experience? I mean, we talk about, you know, Ballon d'Or, we had the project Ballon d'Or when we were there. I mean, what, what's your main, what's your main, you know, thoughts about those, that time? Yeah, Arsenal was probably very similar to the FA expectations. You know, have better players, have a really good playing style and, um, you know, win as well. You know, winning was important at Arsenal. Again, we're in a lot of tournaments um, and we can't get away from the fact there's so much on social media now in terms of whether it's internally or externally, you know, results are out there and... Um, you know, that they, they will create certain perceptions. Um, I think methodology was a big one there. I was, Luke Hobbs was incredible for me. Um, they're the head of coaching and per and Lee in terms of giving me a lot of, uh, um, I remember when I got the job, there was a, there was a different head of coaching in place at the time. And um, it was, a, it was a different type of um, way of doing things, which I had not done before. And I was very open to it. <clears throat> And um, it was more of a sort of Raymond Verheyen sort of methodology. And I, I went on a few of Raymond's courses while I was at Arsenal and they taught me an awful lot about 
being objective and um, object having an objective football language and um, having a methodology, etc. Um, but I remember Luke Hobbs saying to me, "Yeah, we do X, Y, and Z, but you be yourself. You know, we're bringing you in because of who you are and what you've done. Don't change." So that made me feel um, put me in a good place when I first got the job and. Um, it was more the, the the player side again. Hopefully, by this stage, um, I'd, I, I I could do that side of it. What I what I think um, we did well was our coaching model. So we had um, individual techniques coach, and you were a big part of uh, so what we did with the eighteens. Um, we had a game insight coach, and then we had a team tactics coach. So I think the coaching model worked really well. And from a head coach perspective, it was about empowering staff to um, do their jobs well. And then in terms of the methodology, sort of linking everything together, sports science analysis, player progression meetings, player reviews, that was the side of it, which I think I um, had had probably a big, biggest impact, you know, bringing everything together with, with other phase leads like Adam Birchall, um, Lewis Gota. You know, we, we, we worked really collectively together to do that. Yeah, and so, um, I mean, and tell us about Je ne sais quoi. It's a big part of one of your uh, favourite terms you use a lot. Tell some, tell the tell, tell listeners, what, what does that mean? And what, you know, cause I remember you telling, you were telling, the, you tell it to the players, <laughs> you tell telling to the coaches. What does that mean to you? Got a better memory than I have. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was things like, Zavi, for example. So we want the players to keep the ball rather than say, keep the ball. And then the other opposition coach can hear. We had little trigger words. So Zavi meant keep the ball. Cancelo meant, drop, you know, drift inside. Normally it was our outside centre-backs that did it, not our full-backs. Um, Je ne sais quoi was just, I think sometimes with, you know, young people, you can throw all these fancy words at them but sometimes it can be the most simplest and ones that have a bit of humour in it as well. So we would, um, if I want, once I was just speaking to them and saying, listen, come on, I want to see a bit more. I want to see a bit more flair. I want to, I want to see a bit of je ne sais quoi. And they're sort of looking at me thinking I'm mad, um, which I am. But I also did it. And, and what, what je ne sais quoi means I don't know what. So basically you're saying to them, I want to see a bit of, I want I want the opposition to be thinking, I don't know what they're going to do next. Um, but also I did it from a human perspective that I would, I would speak different languages with them to educate them that about other languages, basically. So I might say to a player, qu'est-ce que tu fais? You know, and, and he, again, they're looking at me going, what's he going on about? And then and I say, and then they they knew eventually it meant what are you doing, you know. I could easily say that in English, but I would say to them as, you, as your language is getting on, and obviously some of them are studying languages, and we had other ones who spoke other languages extremely well anyway that were from Mexico, Portugal, etc., Brazil. Um, Edu's son was from Brazil, so I would use that as well to try and develop my Spanish. But je ne sais quoi, I just think. <clears throat> It was about flair and it was about just having a, a common language with the players that was on a bit of a sort of um, low key, light hearted level um, merged with, you know, your you, you, you tactical terminology, etc. So, um, yeah, I don't know if it worked or not, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, and, 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 tell, and tell us about your i mean to think back think back at that time in the 18s you know when we were there I'd, I'd do some ball mastery one ball each some passive pressure some full pressure one v one stuff maybe someone else would do some passing patterns or yourself would do a passing pattern and then you do lots of you know opposed stuff how did you come from that you talked about when you're at mk dons you very much everything was opposed how did you come yeah. to that journey now where you're doing more of, of a mixed sort of approach yeah. with some number opposed some opposed stuff just about your, about your own journey yeah. on that yeah, again, I go back to, I think the youth awards, um, because it didn't say you shouldn't do a drill. When I get, I guess you go on a journey and you go a bit full circle. It's a bit like the FA where when I was coming through and I maybe thought, God, this A license, you know, stop, stand still. This ain't for me. But I look back now and I think the likes of Steve Rutter and John Peacock, they're so intelligent about the game tactically. 
I remember once being stood with Steve Rutter and I said to him, what are you looking at? They were playing at MV11 and he was coaching and he said, I'm looking at all of them. And I remember thinking that's the level, you know, you are, you are literally looking at every player and you need to be aware of where one is and where one should go. So I guess it was the same with Anna Poe's work that I, I sort of went on a journey of it's not for me to, I then saw Steve Holland doing it with the 21s with Gareth and, um, and I sort of started to think back to my time at Tottenham and started to think, yeah, I think that's why they were doing it. And that's the benefit and that's where it fits. And, um, and yeah, so at, at Arsenal, we kind of, as you know, used it as an extended, we didn't really use the word warm up. We'd call it football activation and um, we'll be activating a theme or we'd be doing football coordination, which is what you did so well. And I think I think the key is as well is get people in who who can do it well, you know, understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. It's not my strength, uh, football coordination. You know, we had a lad called um, Josh Smith as well at Arsenal, who you know, and um, he was incredible at the football activation work. And I could just say to him, right, we're playing this shape. We want this combination. We've got these numbers. We need a we need a football uh, we need an activation drill that works that also gets speed and agility out or gets extensive running out and he could go bang you know we obviously had Danny Buck as well with us who was incredible at finishing drills for example so I think we had a really nice session structure where we might have um, a positional possession going on but we don't need every player in that so then we'd give Bucky three or four players and he'd work on he'd do finishing drill there rather than say at the end of training we, we would we would we would we wouldn't conventionally do things like you would do um maybe um in the past it's not to say we wouldn't do finishing drills at the end but we would we, we would also do it within the sessions as well and like i said it would be more position specific or so when we did unit work it wouldn't be every unit working at the same time it might be the midfield unit are working and the defenders and attackers are doing an attack v defence of some sort. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, you know, we were big on passing exercises. Our, our syllabus was very much around um, the zones of the pitch, very similar to um, what we had at Tottenham, I would say. Um, but we, um, the physical element, I guess, when you're doing 18s and 16s, comes into play more as well you know it won't be for everybody the fact that you're looking at gps etc um but um i've seen a benefit of it i've seen where one you're educating players about it but also at arsenal we want to develop most efficient movers so it was important that we had that integrated approach of physical technical tactical and and i'm probably the pain who would be looking at my watch and looking at the live GPS as well and trying to sort of conduct it all with all these really skilled coaches around me and um, maybe putting the reins on at times, but, and also just managing, managing the environment side of it, but making sure that individual uh, needs are coming out and the playing style and the playing style does it a lot of the time, you know, your playing style in your games program often drive everything you know if you've got those two things in place plus the right people you can't really go far wrong and a vision that's really clear and purs was we want to develop strong young gunners with a caring most caring and challenging environment in the world and these are our values and it was as simple as that you know i i i, I haven't been working there for a while and i can still it's still in my head dan ashworth's vision was winning england you know when, when it's very simple couple of words um brian ashton calls it a purpose on a page then you can't go far wrong because it ain't that complicated what what the detail underneath is but the bit the headlines need to be really simple uh, i just and just two last two questions dan i know you're busy man I always remember that you did um when we had team meetings you did a 15 minute it was i think it was in 15 minute like time loop. Also, you set your alarm tell us about that why was that important where'd you get that from why is that important to have short sharp snappy meetings um yeah i think so you know big thing of mine is less is more in terms of information um 
and um, they say, you know, a lot of the research says that people only remember three things anyway from meetings and even from this now, you know, people people might only remember two or three things in 70, 75 minutes. So it's who you're doing it for, first of all. If you're doing it for them, what are the key messages you want them to get from it? And um, And also... I think if you don't do things like that, it can turn into, it could just run away with itself. I think it's good to give yourself a bit of structure. Sometimes <laughs> in my, I might even go 10. And then in my mind, I'm thinking 15, but I'm going to set my alarm for 10. And then if, so, and we're probably going to end up being 12, 13 minutes. And then if, if that's what it, it is, then I think you've got them engaged. You've got their attention. They don't want to be there too long. Um, and also, they're going to be back here tomorrow. They're going to be here again on Thursday and Friday. How much they don't need to know everything now. And it goes back to that Chris Ramsey one about anchoring and chunking the learning as well. So I guess it comes from my learning experiences of being around people of um, how learning takes place. And what would your advice be for a young aspiring coach who wants to have a, a career like yourself in the game? <clears throat> um, I would say, if I think back to what we've been discussing, uh, trying to be around um, people who are, they, not, not, you know, not being afraid to be around people who are ahead of you in the journey and learning from them. Um, and And don't get me wrong, I wasn't, just sitting in those meetings or being around those people and nodding my heads, but I asked an awful lot of questions and I made an awful lot of notes and I made an awful lot of mistakes as well. And, and, you know, we still will, you know, we're all human at the end of the day. So I think it's been around people who, um, you know, because then you see the level, you know, I haven't mentioned Paul Mitchell on this call who I work at MK Dons who's now at Monaco, you know, and, and, and what, what I would say about all these people is their work ethic is is incredible you know at the fa dan ashworth matt crocker gareth dave redding you know the work ethic was second to none um and um and then the coaches that i've worked with you know paul williams paul simpson um kevin betsy you know <clears throat> all these coaches um the work they're relentless in their work um and they're very detailed in their work as well. You know, when I was with, you know, the others at the FA, Steve Coopers, etc. You know, the, it is relentless. Um, and I, I would say that's the biggest thing at all the places I've worked at. Paul Holder, people look at him and think, oh, he's a bit of a nutty professor. You know, he's a bit off the cuff, etc. I, I, I know him probably better than anyone. He, he, he is obsessed, obsessed with coaching and highly, highly skilled. So don't be fooled by these people that they just get there. You know, it will be getting up early, getting in late, and they've all done the hard yards. All these people that I've mentioned have put the nets up. They've done what I had to do at MK Dons where you drive the minibus. And and, and I think those experiences, even if you're at a club where you don't have to do those things, go and do them because they do ground you and they do um, they shape you. For what's what's to come um because otherwise you you could end up taking a shortcut and, and you might not get to where you need to um if you had if you had hadn't have missed those experiences so I, if, if i was if i was to put it into one sentence i would say 100 percent or nothing you know when you're in coaching it's it's 100 percent. it's not 95 it's not 98 you know john mcdermott at tottenham he was 100 percent every day and I'm sure he's doing that as well at the FA. You know, you are, you're hundred percent because you've got other people's careers in your hands and the competition is so fierce. So you, you can't be, and that goes with attention to detail as well. When you're doing something, be precise, do it well. Um, and, you know, keep your bar extremely high because if you're in it for similar reasons to me where, you want to constantly improve and show wherever you work, you're going to take, you're going to leave a positive legacy. Then um, 
you don't do it by being half-hearted. Dan, thanks very much, mate. It's been top. Cheers, Salt.